to turn. We're going to start over in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, we all know it as the chapter, the, the piece of the Bible that's talking about what? Creation. Creation. So we got one Bible scholar back there and John Carl. <laughs> talking about creation. But guys, I'm telling you, there is so much in Genesis chapter 1 that's about you. It's not just about the birds and the bees and the trees and the sun and the moon and stars. This is all about you. And, and by the time you, we get done with this, you ought to be really, really excited about salvation and what God did for you through salvation, what he put on the inside of you. I mean, you ought to be pulling back and looking for that S and trying to find your cape and putting on your little blue tidies. Because you, you start to see something about yourself, and it starts to give you some self-confidence. In all actuality, you ought to be walking out of this room and trying to squeeze your big head through those doors. Because you are so full of yourself <laughs> and what God actually did for you. So Genesis chapter 1, are you there? If you don't know where it's at, just open up the first couple pages in your Bible, and you will find it. Genesis chapter 1, first book of the Bible there. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And I want you to notice verse 3, he said, And God said, Let there be light, and there was what? Now, if you, read, if you read on through chapter 1, you find out this is not when the sun was created. This is not when the sun, the moon, the stars was created. It, it's going on, if you go on down into another day, you see that's when what we know is the sun that brings heat. That's when it was created. But right here when God said, let there be light, that's not when the sun showed up. He, <laughs> that's not when the sun showed up. He said, let there be light. The original Hebrew says, light be but this was not when the sun showed up. This is when God released himself. I just saw it not too long ago. This is when God released himself. Later on, you find out that's when the sun and, and the moon and the stars show up because then he begins to create these things. But in the very beginning, before anything happens, he said, light be, he released himself. <sighs> And the Bible tells us that, that all these things after that begin to be created. And science tells you that light is still expanding. The universe is still expanding at the speed of light. It's still expanding. I mean, for millions of years, the universe is still expanding, still expanding. And it all began from God releasing himself. Light be. Because the Bible says that God is light. It says that, the Bible says God, he is, he is light. He is life. He is truth, but it also says that he is light. And, and not to get too ahead of ourselves, but just to give you, just to kind of preface it a little bit. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, in him, talking about Jesus Christ, in him was what? Life. And that life was the light of men. Actually, so we're going to change this all up. So turn over to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. There's just some things I was seeing uh, this morning. That's why I was a little late getting out here because I, I got a little excited and started preaching myself in my office. You know, the Bible says that the Word of God, it is alive. Do you understand that? Th this is not just some little book you check out of the library and read, you know, just to do some good read. The Bible is alive. The Word of God, it's alive. And every time you open this thing up, you ought to be expecting not just to read some black and white words, but to actually hear from the voice of God through the words. I mean, you ought to be learning something, every, seeing something different every time you open it up. And 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and in verse 6, it says, For it's the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who is shown in our hearts to notice this, to give what? Give what? Give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. And look at verse 7. Man, this is where it gets good. Verse 7, it says, but we have this what? We have this treasure. We have this light. Where? Where at? In us. This is not talking about when you get to heaven. Come on, friends. This is not when you die, when we all get to heaven. No. This is while you're on the earth. He said, we have this treasure. We have this light. We have this life. Where? 
in these earthen vessels. This thing when you wake up in the morning, you walk in the bathroom and you go, Ooh, look how sexy I am. That body you got. He said that life, that light is on the inside of you. He said this power, this life, this treasure, we have it in these earthen vessels. That the excellence of the what? Of the power of God. This is not talking about just to make you a good little nice little Christian. He said the same life that God released when he, he said, light be, life be. And he released himself into the universe. He said that same life, that same light, that treasure, he placed it on the inside of you in this body. That the excellence would be of the power of God and not of you. Now, hold your place there. We're going to come back to this. But hold your place there and go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter uh, 1. So I wanted you to see that, that that life, that life that God released in the very, very beginning to start creation, that life, that light, he, he released himself into the universe. And the universe is still expanding because the universe cannot contain it. You think about how large and how great and how expansive the universe is. I mean, think about just the Milky Way galaxy. I mean, absolutely amazing. And scientists, every time they think that they have found the outer reach, all of a sudden they find out it's bigger than what they thought. And all of the galaxies that they thought that they had, had found, they keep finding more. Why? Because the universe itself cannot contain the very life and light of God. And yet what's very, very interesting is that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, God said, let's make man in our image and in our likeness, let's make them to be like us. He said, let's give them dominion and authority over all of the earth, everything that creeps on the earth. Let's make them to be like us so they can live like us, operate like us. Not that we would uh, be able to replace God. We're absolutely dependent on him for everything. But he said, let's make a creature. Because remember, he already had the angels up to this point. He already had them, but they weren't like him. They, they weren't on his level. They couldn't fellowship with him. They were just servants to do what he told them to do. But God created man not only for fellowship, but he needed some more people. He wanted to join the family business. And he said, let's make man in our image and our life. Let's make them to be like us. Now, let me ask you a question. How can you be like somebody yet not have all the same stuff they have? can't. You have, you have to have the same stuff. And that's why in Genesis chapter 2 and in verse 7, it says that God, he formed the body of, of Adam from the dust, from the dirt of the ground, right? He forms the body, but, but that isn't what you are. You are not a body, right? You're not a body. This is, is not you. The Bible tells us that you are a spirit, because why? God is a spirit. He's the father of Spirits. He is not a body. And if you've been made in his image and his likeness and he is your father and you are his child, that means you are a spirit. Because he is a, but for you to operate in this world, you needed a what? You needed a body. So this is just your house. This is just your tent that you live in and you're able to operate in this world. In, but you are a spirit. And God said, let's make them in our image and likeness. Let's make them like us. But he made the, and fashioned this body. But notice once he made the body, the body is just still there. It's not, not doing anything. It's not animated. There's no life in it. And so God turns around. And the Bible says in, in verse 7 that he breathed the breath of life into Adam. He, God put himself. He, he put himself into that body. And when God's life got into that body, all of a sudden that body, What? The body began to move, it began to operate, it began to function. And so there's several keys, there's several nuggets here that, that we find out here is that number one is that your body was made to be a slave to your spirit. See, we think it's the opposite of the way around because we glorify the body, we make the body first, we study the body, we educate ourselves about the body. But when it comes to educating ourselves about who we really are, that, that's very few and far between and when you actually hear about it. And so in society, in our world, and as a result, because it hasn't been taught, now it's in the church, and it's been in the church for centuries, the body is elevated. And so what the body says, that's what I do. What the body says, that's what I am, because it's all about the body, and there's not much told and talked about as far as the spirit. But you are not a body, you are a what? You are a spirit. And so if you want to find out what you're like, 
And, and this is where it gets, gets you kicked out of some churches. But if you want to find out what you're like, you've got to look at God. That'll preach. That'll get you results. But it makes some people mad at you too. But if you want to find out what you're like, you've got to look at your daddy. And if you have a problem with saying God, then you've you got to look at Jesus. People have a problem with that one too. But if you want to know what you like, you got to look at your father. When you got born again through salvation, then you took on his DNA. You got new DNA, a new family, a new heritage, a new ancestry. You came from a brand new place. You got a brand new father. I don't care if you had a horrible father, a horrible mother growing up. You got a new one now once you got born again. If you didn't have a family, if you were adopted, hey, you know what? It's okay because you got a daddy now. Once you get born again, you got a brand new father, a brand new family, brand new DNA, a brand new genes on the inside. Everything's different. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be what? Be in Christ, born again, becomes a brand new creation. Old things passed away, the old way of living, the old family, the old ancestry, everything that began to run through your bloodline, it's all cut off now because everything is brand new. God said, let's make man in our image and in our likeness. This was God's plan from the very, very beginning. And just because man messed up God's plan in the beginning doesn't mean it's going to stop God's plan from being finished. But you see, God makes the body and he puts himself in it. And I want you to think about this. And this is the reason that we looked at first at Genesis 1, uh, 3 and 4 there and went over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Think about this. God releases himself into the universe. And we know that the universe has been expanding for millions and millions. It's been expanding and expanding and expanding. And nothing can stop it. The universe itself, as big and as vast and as expansive as it is, it cannot contain the life of God. But God put his life in your spirit and your spirit can contain it. That's how mighty and magnificent he made you to be. I don't know if you're catching the significance of that, but I literally just saw this about five minutes ago. The universe cannot contain him, but your spirit can. Just think about it. I, I know it's a mind bitter, but think about it. The universe, it cannot contain how great and powerful and magnificent and glorious and majestic that he is. It cannot contain him. It cannot contain him. But God made your spirit to be able to contain him. So that everywhere you go, what was released into the universe is literally on the inside of your spirit right now. My God, it's on the inside of you, right? God made your spirit because he made you like him. Think about it. God made man in his image and in his likeness. He made him like him. And God took what was on the inside of him and he released it into the universe. And the universe, as big as it is, it pales in comparison to you. It cannot stop it. It cannot contain it. It can't do anything with it but just, just give way and say, whatever you want, I'll do. I'm your servant. But you, made in God's image like him, to be able to contain what he has on the inside of him. God's life, the, the Zoe, eternal, abundant, everlasting life that he is, God made you to be able to contain it. He made you to be able to contain it. Literally, everywhere you go, the substance that's, that created the universe and is still flowing. Because the universe can't stop. The universe can't, can't, can't contain it. You literally contain it everywhere that you go. So that literally tells you you are a living, walking miracle waiting to happen anywhere and everywhere that you go. See, the life of God, it, he used it to create and this is why the Bible tells us that when God, see, see, see the Jewish rabbis, they believe this. This is what they teach. They believe that in Genesis chapter 2 and in verse 7 when it says that God formed the body of man and then he, he put his life into them, the Jewish rabbis preach and teach that when God did that, that the angels stood right there and watched and they couldn't tell which one was God and which one was Adam. That's what the, the, the rabbis preach and teach. The angels could not tell which was which. 
Because God made Adam to be just like him in every way except he was dependent on God. He made him in his image and his likeness, and he put the substance of himself into that body. And that's why it also goes on to say in verse 7 in the Hebrew, it says, God made man to be a speaking spirit. He made him to be a speaking spirit so he could act just like his father. See, this goes far beyond this idea of Christianity that we have watered down so badly to where I accept Jesus as my Savior. I go through hell on earth. I can't wait till I die and get to heaven because, oh, it's going to be so much better. That's the Christianity that has been watered down so much to this point today. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm just a, you know, I'm an unrighteous, unworthy worm under a bucket of scum. And you know, one day I'm just going to slither on by and barely get in on there. And I might be able to give Peter a high five if I can get high enough. Like, that's the Christianity that we know of. But that is not the Christianity that the Bible talks about. See, guys, you got to remember in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, this was God's plan for man. And God has never changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. This was his intent with man. And yet we know the rest of the story that Adam, he messed up. It wasn't the woman's fault. We talk about Eve. It wasn't the woman's fault. It was Adam's fault. He wasn't a man one day. He didn't stand up to protect his wife. He didn't stand up to protect creation that God had created and put in his control and his authority. It was Adam's fault. I don't know about you, but when we get to heaven, how many, you want to, how many of you want to punch Adam just once? Say, you fool. <laughs> Look at what we had to do because of you. It was all his fault. But, like we said in the beginning, one man's mistake was not going to stop the plan of God. And so God, he had a, he had a plan, and his plan was Jesus. And the Bible refers to Jesus as the last Adam. The second Adam, the last Adam. And so God's plan was to send a man. Because Jesus had to do life as a man. And in Philippians chapter 2, it tells us that Jesus, he laid aside everything that gave him an advantage in life. And he humbled himself and he did life as a man. So every time that you read in the Gospels, Jesus doing something, he did it just like you. He did it as you. He had a body like you, a mind like you, a brain like you. The Bible says he was tempted in every single way to go through the temptations that you and I go through. And did life just like you and I do. So that he could be our high priest. He could be our example. He could also be our sacrifice. But Jesus was God's plan to restore that life. Now think about it. God put that life into Adam and Adam lost it. That's what it says when, when God said, Adam, the, don't eat of that fruit because if you do, you'll die. You'll die. He was going to die spiritually. And we know this is the case because when he ate of the fruit, did he die physically? No. He is still very much alive physically. But friends, that life that God put on the inside of him had saturated every single cell and fiber of his being. And there was so much of that life in there, his body had to, had to learn to die. And the Bible tells us that Adam, even though spiritually dead, separated from God, lost what was in his spirit, that was no longer there. But there was so much of it still in his body. It took him over 900 years to die. Over 900 years, spiritually dead, sinner, but he didn't know anything about death. His mind hadn't been programmed like ours is to accept what's real in this world and what's normal in this world. The, the normal in this world now was not his normal. His normal was what was normal in heaven. All he knew was heaven. That's all he knew. That was his mindset. That's all he knew. And so not only did his mind have to be renewed to the, the world's new normal, but his body also had to learn to let go of it. It took 900 years of seeping, of it getting out. Because his body was so saturated with it. And you'll, you'll see where this is scriptural. His body was so saturated with it. So Jesus comes, and real quickly, if, if you turn over to John chapter 1, and your friends, you'll find this all throughout the Bible. It's all there. And the more I study this, the more that we teach on this, the, way, the more that we minister this way, it's amazing to me that we have seen these things and just glossed over it. We've seen the Scriptures. These are Scriptures you've read, you know. But it's amazing to me how, how the puzzle pieces were there and we never put them together. 
While you're turning to John, turn to John chapter 1 and verse 4. While you're turning there, I want you to think about Adam again. When does sickness and disease and death show up? After he sinned, after he died spiritually, and all this curse came upon the earth, that's when sickness and disease and death started reigning and ruling. That's when these things started happening. But friends, God's plan was never for you to, to deal with these things, experience these things. He put something on the inside of man so that regardless of what man came against, what was on the inside of him was greater than what was on the outside. That was the plan. This was medicine from heaven on the inside. Now see, the Bible tells us that the Garden of Eden, he made it just like heaven. It was absolutely perfect. But he gave Adam dominion and authority and he told him to go outside of that garden and to expand this thing. Take what you see and make everything else to look like this. And so that tells you that the rest of the earth was not like the garden. Because remember when Adam walked out, things were different. Things were different. And it was his job to go out and make things look like that. But all of a sudden, he lost the authority, he lost the ability, he lost the equipment. He didn't have that life anymore. But God's plan was for this to be on the inside of us, to always protect you, to always heal you, so you could walk in divine health. Nothing would ever come in your way that you would literally be like a bug zapper. Anybody have a bug zapper, especially in the summer around here? What happens? You cut that thing on, and the bugs come against it, and that power, that juice is on the inside. Once they touch that metal, bzzz, 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 and, 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 and the light, that life is far more powerful than the stuff that's coming against it. And when the things of this world come against that life and that light, what happens? It dies. Touches it, and it dies. Why? Because what's on the inside is far more powerful than what's on the outside. And God made you that way. He made Adam that way. Well, then Adam lost that power. He lost that life. But Jesus came to get it back. And so in John chapter 1 and in verse 4, it says that in him, talking about Jesus Christ, in Christ, in him was what? Life. life. It's the very same word, very, very same meaning. It's that zoe life, eternal, what we know as eternal life, abundant life, everlasting life. What we attribute to salvation and going to heaven. The Bible says that God put this inside of Jesus. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. And it says, and the, the darkness could not what? The darkness could not, the, the New King James Version says comprehend. That word compre comprehend literally means just over, overcome. It couldn't overpower it. It couldn't overcome it. couldn't conquer it. The darkness, the things of this world could not overcome what was on the inside. Guys, darkness can never overcome light. Light is always more powerful than darkness. I mean, we could cut out every single light in here and it would go pitch black because there's no windows in here. But then you could get the light on your phone. And all of a sudden, just that one little light, all of a sudden, it begins to push darkness back automatically. And you don't even have to necessarily release your faith for it. You just cut the light on. But it says that that light always conquered, always overcame what, what was on the outside, the darkness. The darkness could not overcome it. So you see that God, he recognized the issue, recognized the problem, and he had a plan. He was going to send Jesus to be your Savior. But he was going to put what was on the inside of him and what he originally put in Adam, he put it into Jesus. Because God's plan was not just to get you to heaven. God's plan was to get himself back into you. And in John chapter 1 and verse 4, God begins the process and he, and he put himself into Jesus. And then in John uh, chapter 5 and in verse 21, I want you to see this real quick. John chapter 5 and verse 21. So John 1, we see that Jesus had this life put in him. He had nothing to do with it. Jesus didn't cause this. God did this. This was the grace of God. He put his life inside of Jesus. And then... In John chapter 5, and in verse uh, 21, it says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives what? Gives life to them. This is Jesus talking. It's in red. He said, even, the so, even so the Son does what? Even so the Son gives life. Now, friends, you can't give away something you don't have. 
You cannot give something to somebody that you do not possess. Right? I mean, this is my phone. And because this is my phone, I can give it to anybody I want because it's mine. Right? Now, Cindy has a phone. I can't give you Cindy's phone because it ain't mine. I don't possess her phone. It's not mine. But I can give you what's mine. I can give you what I possess. I can give you what I have. And so we begin to find out that Jesus understands that what God put on the inside of him, Jesus actually knows it's there. Because you can't give away something you don't know you have. Right? Now, I could go in, and, and if you didn't have a phone, I could slip one in your pocket without you knowing it. And you know what? You could go around the whole day wishing you could give somebody a phone. But if you don't know that you have it, you can't do anything with it. And this is where the vast majority of Christians are today. Something got put on the inside of them, but they don't know that it's there. And so, getting a little ahead of ourselves, so now they, they're begging God. Asking God to do something. When God already did. Right? So John chapter 5 verse 21, he says, As the Father, notice this word as, that means to the very same degree, in the very same way. He's in the very same way that the Father raised the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son. And notice the phrase, to whomever he will. See, when you know that you have something, you can give it away. And not only can you give it away, you can, you can give it to anybody you want. And notice Jesus didn't say it, but I got to ask God's permission. See, when God gives you something, you don't have to ask God's permission to be able to give it away. It's yours. If I give you something, you don't have to come up to me and say, hey, can I give it to such and such? Why? Because it's yours. I already gave it to you. Right? It's yours. And then look at verse 26. Look at what Jesus says here in the same conversation. John 5 and verse 26. He said, for as the Father has life, where? As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life, where? And himself. So now we know that we know that we know that Jesus knows he has this. He said the very same life to the very same degree, the very same quality, the very same quantity that God has it in himself. He has granted me to have it in me too. Every, in other words, he said everything that the Father has is now he's given it to me. He's put it on the inside of me. Well, but isn't this what God did for Adam in Genesis chapter 2, verse 26, or verse 7, and Genesis 1, 26 and 27? Let's make man in our image and in our likeness, and now let's give him the same substance that we have so he can live like us and be like us. It's exactly what happened in Genesis, and it's starting all over again. You could literally look at this as like the New Testament version of Genesis chapter 1 and 2 of mankind. This is creation from mankind again. In him was what? Life, and that life was the light of men, the same light that God released into the universe. And the universe can't contain it, but your spirit can. You see, Jesus could contain, he was a spirit, and you can contain it, you're a spirit. That means wherever you go, you can release it, because you still got some there. See, the universe can't contain it. I mean, it's just, but you're a container of it. Guys, I mean, if you don't get anything today, and, I, I am, and I'm trying to contain my excitement because I literally saw this right before I came out. This whole thing about the universe, expand, the universe can't contain it, but you as a spirit, you can. You can. And Jesus said, everything, that life, that same life the Father has, he gave it to me. He gave it to me, and I can give it away. To whomever I will. This is why you never see Jesus. You never, ever, 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 ever. I'll give anybody a thousand bucks if you can find one time where Jesus prayed to God and said, God, Father, heal that person. You'll never find it. Why? Because God put in Jesus a substance to release into those bodies to bring about the, the needed desire and, and, and the needed result in that body. He put it on the inside of it. He put it on the inside. Friends, this is why Jesus was never sick. People would say, oh, he was never sick because he was a son of God. Yeah, but he was doing life as a son of man. And he had a body just like you. He had a body just like you. But he was so full and saturated with the life of God. See, think about this. We were talking about that light. Remember in the Bible when it says that Jesus was on the mountain 
And Peter, James, and John were with him. And all of a sudden, Jesus was in prayer. He's, he's praying to the Father. And all of a sudden, it says that he was transfigured. Or in other words, his body changed. And all of a sudden, he lit up like a light bulb. And it says that his body was shining like a, a, a white, bright light. And he was shining. And not only was his body shining, his clothes were too. So what was on the inside of his spirit was so saturated in his body, his body couldn't contain it, and it got off into his clothes. And this wasn't a one-time thing, because if, even if you read in the Old Testament, you see that Moses, when Moses was on the mountain with God for 40 days, just Moses as a sinner, remember he was a sinner. He was a murderer. He was not saved. He messed up severely. But even a sinner in the presence, in the, in, the, in the manifest presence of God, that light of God, the presence of God, it got into his body. It got into his skin. And his skin couldn't contain it. And the Bible says that when Moses came down the mountain, his face was shining and it freaked everybody out. And so he put a cloth on his face so everybody wouldn't get scared. Because the light of God had so saturated his body. Now, if, if, the light, if the life of God would enter into the body of a sinner like that from the outside, what do you think will happen for the saint when that same power is on the inside? Come on, guys. A sinning murderer. And that, that life, that light got into his skin from the outside. But his skin could not contain it. See, his skin, his body was of the earth. The earth cannot contain it. The universe cannot contain it. But your spirit can. And if that happened for a murdering sinner from the outside. And then Jesus, the Bible says in John chapter 10 verse 10. Jesus said, I came not to take you somewhere. I came to give you something. Right? He said that the thief has come to what? To steal, kill, and destroy. But I came so I could give you, so you could have life, abundant life, eternal life. Notice Jesus did not say, I came to die on the cross so you could go to heaven. He did not say that. Now thank God for heaven. There is a heaven. There's a heaven to gain. There's a hell to shun. And whenever you take your last breath as a, as a Christian, or if Jesus comes back, hey, we all get to go to heaven. But that is not what we're living for. If the whole purpose was for you to get saved and go to heaven, then he would save you and then you'd be out of here. That's not the purpose. That was not the purpose of Jesus coming. Jesus came, he said, I came so you could have something. See, in the same way that God said, Jesus, I'm going to put this on the inside of you. I want you to have something. I'm going to put it on the inside of you. Jesus said, I'm going to do just like my father did. And I'm coming to duplicate myself. And he said, everything that the Father has and he put on the inside of me, I'm coming so you can have it too. Why? Because Jesus was coming as the last Adam. He was coming to get back into humanity what Adam lost. And if you don't believe me, and if this isn't good enough for you, and that's fine, turn to John chapter 17. Real quick, John chapter 17. So this is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying, and he's about to go to the cross. And I love John 17. Uh, just, well, we'll read this real quick. Start off with, uh, with verse 14. John chapter 17 and verse 14. And Jesus said, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, because notice this, they are what? They're not of this world. Just as, notice that phrase, just as, which means what? To the very same degree, very same quality, very same way. He said, just as I am not from here, they're not from here either. He said, I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them or set them apart by your truth, for your word is true. That word truth, it means reality. See, there's a reality here on the earth, but there's also a greater reality in heaven. There, there, there's the earthly realm and there's the spiritual realm. And the earthly realm was made from the spiritual realm. So what you see here, it's real, but there's something far more real. There's something far more superior to what you see and feel and hear and taste touch here. And Jesus is talking about this. And he said, you're from the other realm. And then in verse 18, he said, as you sent me into the world, I'm also sending them into the world. So the very same way that God sent Jesus is the very same way that Jesus is sending us. And we'll get into this next week. 
God did, <laughs> God did not send Jesus ill-equipped. God did not send Jesus into this world lacking anything to get the job done. He gave him everything that he needed so that no matter what situation he was facing, Jesus and that light on the inside of him would always overcome it. Would always overcome it. And this is where it gets good. And so verse 20, he said, I do not pray for those alone, these alone, but also I pray for those who will believe in me through their word. So now for those people that would say, well, Jesus was just talking about the disciples. No, no, no. Now he's talking about you. He said, all of those that will come, all of those who will believe in me through their word. How many of us have believed in him through this word? Most of us that are sitting here, I guarantee most that are, that are watching online, watching by TV, we have believed in him. So Jesus is praying for you right here. So this is where you get excited. And he said, I pray that they would be one. He's talking about you. He said, I pray that they would be one as, I mean, it's two little letters, one little word, but so powerful and so significant. He said, I pray that they would be one as you, Father, are in me. He said, I pray that they would have the same union with me that I have with you. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they would be one in who? Us, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and You should never have a self-esteem problem. Anyway, I thought that was good. So, okay, thank you, John. I can always count on John. He said, that they would be one in us, that the world would believe that you sent me. Now, how would the world know that, that because of salvation, that God sent Jesus? Because you look like him, you smell like him, you talk like him, you act like him, you get results just like him too. He said, I'm, I pray that they would be one in us so the world would know that you sent me. See, friends, this is not just about being a nice little person. This is not just about helping the, the, the little old lady across the road. This is not just about helping out the homeless person on the corner of the street. You can be a sinner, a ranked sinner, and do that. But if you're going to work the supernatural power of God, when Jesus said, those who believe in me will do the very same works as me, if you're going to experience the power, if you're going to experience the supernatural, if you're going to hear from God and see from God and get results like God, there's got to be a union with him so that you have the same equipment and the same abilities and the same substance. And that substance is the divine life of God that he put on the inside of you. And Jesus is about to tell you about it right here. Look at verse 22. He said, and the glory that you gave me, I have done what? I have given it to them. Notice this phrase. So that they would be one just as we are one. So you cannot be one with the Father without the same substance. You cannot be one with someone without having the same stuff. It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. But Jesus said, everything you gave me, I'm going to give it to them so that we can be one. Guys, think about it. I mean, it'd be like a, like a tree and, and, and you know, the, the substance that's flowing through the vine, substance that's flowing through the roots and the trunks, you know, the trunk of the tree, it flows there, but it doesn't go to the branches. It's absolutely impossible. What's coming up, it has to go to the branches because they're connected. They're, they're one together. I've never driven by, you know, a tree and said, man, look how pretty that trunk is. Or look how, look how nice that one branch is. No, you, you see the whole thing and it's, it's one. It's like, oh man, that tree is gorgeous. It's beautiful. But even within that tree, there, there's lots of different components and lots of different pieces. And so there's, there's pieces that are separate yet all together it's one. And that's the way it is with you and Jesus. I mean, you're two distinct entities, but yet you're, you're one. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says that you are one spirit with the Lord. You're one. You're separate, but you're, but you're one. And so I put it like this, that, that in my devotion and in my worship and in my praise, we're separate. I'm dependent on him. I worship him. I, I, I'm devoted to him. I, I, I praise him. I, I, I pray to him. I'm entirely dependent on him. But in life and ministry, we're one. But in my devotion and dependency, we're two. But in life and ministry, we're one. That's why Paul said over in uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6, he said, As you have received Jesus as your Lord, now walk in him. So you see two, 
But then in life and ministry, you walk as one. And this is what Jesus is talking about. He said, I, let's make them one with us so that the world would know that you sent us. See, in all actuality, and I'm not trying to get too deep, but in all actuality, we should be able to say exactly like Jesus said with full confidence that if you've seen me, you've seen him. See, it's why Jesus was able to say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because he was made in his image and in his likeness. And then God put himself into Christ. But see, this hasn't been talked about enough. And we're more confident in being an unrighteous, unworthy worm under a bucket of scum, sinner saved by grace. We're more confident in saying that than saying, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. And so that's why we don't see the results that we know we should be seeing. It's why we don't see the miracles today that we know we should be seeing. It's why people are asking all over the world and all the churches, why are we not seeing the miracles of the Bible? Because you think you're a lowly sinner saved by grace instead of seeing yourself as a legit son of God, looking like him, smelling like him, acting like him, getting results like him, just like him, as if, as if it was him doing it himself. See, the Bible says in Romans that all of the world is yearning and waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. The world is crying out. The trees and the rocks and the earth is crying out. Can I please see a real legit son of God? And the whole time, there's millions of them walking all over the place. They just don't realize it. See, we know 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. If you ask somebody that scripture, most people say this. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Right? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. But have you ever read the, the first part of 1 John 4, 4? It says, what? Little children, you are born of God. You are born of God, little children, and greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You are born of God. Do you look at that phrase of, that word of? It literally means to be derived of the very same quality and very same substance. Well, we know this to be true in the natural realm. When you're born of your parents, you got some of your parents in you. But how dare you think that you could actually have some of God on the inside of you? So you talk like that, and all of a sudden people think you're weird. Always one of those fanatics, one of those radical people. Well, how's normal working for you? Huh? How's normal working for you? How's normal working for you? How's your normal Christianity working for you? How, how, when's the last time in your normal Christianity you saw a blind eye open? Or you saw a leg grow out? Or you saw a tumor dissolve right in front of your face? When's the last time you saw that with your normal Christianity? You and your little worm under a bucket of scum, sinners saved by grace, hoping to get to heaven. How's that working for you? How many, how many times in a week is the devil just kicking your butt? How's that working for you? When's the last time you actually got your prayers answered? How's normal Christianity working for you? Why don't you try something a little radical? See, Jesus never meant for you to be balanced. I don't like this word balanced. I'm just trying to be balanced in my Christian walk, you know. I don't want to get too far off over here. and don't want to get too far off over here. God doesn't want you balanced. He wants you to stick out like a sore thumb. Now, he doesn't want you weird because that's what we got. We got a lot of weird Christians freaking people out. You know, that's why when the news gets a hold of, you know, spirit-filled, Bible-believing people, they go to the, 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 the rankest mobile home they can find in the backwoods, the people playing with the snakes and the Kool-Aid and say, man, look at those weird people. And that's, and that's, and that's why, you know, when, when people walk in places like here or other places and you just mention the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you see whole rows of people just get up and walk out. Because they're freaked out. You think you're going to pull out the snake. That's why I told Lacey when they had that kids' church and big church that day. I said, you better be careful with that snake. You better explain. You better explain. You <laughs> she comes in here with those snakes. I'm thinking, there you go. All these, <laughs> all these, all these opinions that, they, that people have about us. Now you're showing that it's true. You're bringing up the snakes. Because that's people's ideas. Why? Because people will not grasp this to be what it really is. That God made you to be like him. Totally 100% dependent on him, but to be like him and manifest him and get the same results as if it was him doing it himself. All right, look, I got one minute. So look, 
Turn back over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Real quick, I promise Lacey, I, I'm going I'm to I'm start being on time. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, real quick. I want you to see this in one more. 2 Corinthians 4, this is where we started. It says that God, He commanded that light to shine out. Remember that light that went into the universe? And He says it, that treasure's in this earthen vessel, right? And He said in verse 10, He said, We're always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Notice this phrase, that the life of who? Jesus would be made manifest where? In our bodies. Not when you get to heaven. This life that's on the inside of you is not just to sit in your spirit. It was made to affect your body. Everything that we've been wanting and people are praying for God and begging for God to do and, and give them, it's literally on the inside of your spirit. And it was made not to just be contained, but to be released. Guys, this right here is divine health. God never meant for us to go from miracle to miracle to miracle to miracle to miracle, from healing to healing to healing to healing. He meant for us to walk in divine health. And so people would say, well, but if that's on the inside of me, why am I still experiencing sickness? Well, it's a number of reasons, but most importantly, it comes down to, one, either we don't know that it's there, or two, if we do know that it's there, we're just not as aware of it as we should be. We're more aware of the sickness than we are of the medicine. And I can prove it to you. So look, one more time. So in verse 10, he said, the life of, the, of Jesus would be made manifest in our body. And then if you didn't get it the first time, he said, for we who live were always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. That what? So that the life of Jesus would be made manifest where? In our mortal flesh. So for people who would say, well, he's talking about heaven. No, that's a bunch of bunk. He said, in your mortal flesh, this right here. He said, the life of Jesus would be made manifest in this not when I get to heaven, this stuff right here that's made of the earth, made of the dirt. Right here. And then for the sake of time, Romans chapter 8, verse 11, it says the same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead. He said, he's on the inside of you giving what? Giving life to your, what body? Mortal body. It's giving life to your, guys, it's all throughout the scripture. He's there on the inside. That life is there to make, be made manifest in your body, to flow out of your spirit and into your body so that we don't deal with allergies. We don't deal with flu. We don't deal with cancer. All the things that are of the world, God never intended for us to have to deal with the effects of it. And so you could say, I mean, but yeah, I'm dealing with stuff, but that's okay. This isn't condemning anybody, criticizing anybody, we have to be aware of what God put on the inside of us. And the more aware we become of what's on the inside of us, and I'm not talking about head knowledge. I'm not talking about just knowing Scripture. But the more real that becomes on the inside of you, this divine life, that substance on the inside. Friends, I'm telling you, it is the cure for any, anything that you're dealing with. And it's the cure for anything that anyone else is dealing with. For the sinner or for the saint. Friends, the life of God, it is not prejudice. It does not know the difference between the sinner. It does not know the difference between the saint. Because every single person that Jesus healed in his ministry was a what? Was a sinner. There was no salvation made available. So friends, even if you, you being a saint, you being saved, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how badly you've messed up. It, if, it'll, if it'll work for the person who doesn't have Jesus, it'll work for the person that's covered under the blood and redeemed by the blood of Jesus that's still working out their salvation. So you never have to think that your righteousness or your right living or your mistakes is a hindrance to what's on the inside. All you need to know is I got some medicine on the inside of me. The very same life that, that God released and the very same life, that, it, and you'll see it next week, the very same life that flowed into, into Jesus and flowed out of Jesus and flowed into the multitudes, it's on the inside of me. The Bible says in, in, in Romans, it says over in Corinthians that, that when your mind, when you put your mind on the things of the Spirit, that it produces two things. It produces life and it produces peace. That word peace meaning nothing missing, nothing broken, wholeness. So, so, so for those of you who may not be here next week, you're saying, man, well, how, how do I get this to work? And it's what you put your mind on. You already have it on the inside of you. But he said those that are spiritually minded, the result of that will be life and will be peace.
And so I would highly, highly encourage you, spend some time thinking about what's on the inside of you. Life. Those of you that grew up in church like I did, I promise I'm shutting up right here. Those of you that grew up in church like I did, we used to sing a little song. It said, I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up a well. See, Jesus said, there's a, there's a well I'm going to give you. He, said, he told the woman at the well, he said, if you would have asked me, I would have given you I would have given you some water that would never run out. He said, I'm going give, to give to you something that's going to be like a well springing up into everlasting life. See, there's this substance that's trying to, to ooze on out of your spirit, and it's right there just to get into your body. And the more you become spiritually minded and put your mind on that, it will flow, and it will flow, and it will flow, and it will flow, and it will flow. And it's exactly what David was talking about in Psalm 91. Those who abide under the shelter of the Almighty, who abide in Him, no evil will befall you. No plague or calamity shall near come near your tent. We could go on and on and on with this, but we're going to stop. So say this with me. I've got the life of God in me. I'm full of His Spirit and His ability. I've got the life of God in me. The same life that flows out of God and is flowing in the universe and flowed into Jesus is now flowing in me. Jesus is the vine, and I am the branch. And what flows in Jesus, it flows in me. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. And the life of Jesus is on the inside of me, and it's being made manifest in my flesh. It's affecting my mortal body right now. It's flowing into every pain right now. It's flowing into every piece that's diseased right now. Every part of my body that has some death in it, has some stuff of the world that shouldn't be there. By faith, I release the life of God right now out of my spirit. And I command it to flow into my body and bring about healing and bring about health to bring life and wholeness and peace into my body. Those things that aren't operating, I command them to begin to operate right now. Those joints that, that had lack of motion and movement, I thank you the life of God's flowing into it right now. Like oil being put onto a rusty joint, a rusty bolt, that these things are being loosened up and being released right now. The life of God on the inside of me. The life of God on the inside of me, flowing into my body, flowing into my body. What needs to be created, being created. What needs to be fixed, being fixed right now. Removing what needs to be removed and creating what needs to be created. I've got the life of God in me. I've got a river of life, and it's flowing out of me. It makes what's lame to walk, and it makes the blind to see. What's been prisoned and chained up in my body is now being released with liberty. I've got the life of God on the inside of me. Hallelujah. Everywhere that I go, miracles happening through me. Everywhere that I go, the creative force and power and life of God, not only for my body, but also all those that I come in contact with. All those that are around me, so that I'm just like Peter and his shadow. Just when people, they want to get near me, just so they can experience that life. They want to touch me, just so that what's flowing in me will flow out of me and flow into them. So that they would see Jesus and hear Jesus, but also experience Jesus through me. Hallelujah. Praise be unto God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What's flowing in Jesus right now at the right hand of God is flowing on the inside of you right now. Come on, guys. This is not religion. This is not some made-up doctrine. This is Christianity. This is real Christianity. This is the life of a Christian. This is the life of a man or a woman in Christ, united with Christ, united and filled with God himself. Hallelujah. Praise be unto God. Hallelujah. Say it with me. The Lord, He's good, and His mercy endures forever. The Lord, He's good to me, 
and His mercy endures forever. He is good to me. The Lord, He's good to me. And His mercies endure forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Praise be unto God. Hallelujah. So see, you ought to be looking for that big S right now. There ought to be some, some red undies on right now, you know. <laughs> you start talking like this. You start thinking like this. People think you're nutty. People think you're batty. But man, you get in the bedroom and you just want to... You feel, like, you feel like you're something special because you are. You are something special. You are not from here. You were you are sent, created, born, birthed from another place. Sent here not to, not to just fit in, but to stand out and take over. 